On the 25th of August this year, Bondware released Update 1029, announcing that it would be the last one for Poser 12. That means that whatever we have now is the final state for Poser 12. In the early months after version 12 was released a year ago, it was the most buggy version ever released, but I was hopeful that Bondware would fix all the bugs and maybe implement some critical features. The company produced 75 internal patches and released them as more than a dozen updates during the program's brief lifespan, mostly fixing previous bugs, sometimes introducing new ones, adding a few nice quality of life improvements and missing the mark on some of the program's serious shortfalls. However, I thought that now, just as the company is announcing the switch to work on Poser 13, it would be a good time to recap the state of the current program. When I reviewed it, there were two particularly compelling reasons to buy it. The easier to use principled cycles node, and more importantly, dramatically faster rendering, thanks to the killer combination of NVIDIA Optics support and the Intel Denoiser, which enables you to render at a much lower quality and then run an algorithm that gives you a much better result. For me, this single feature warranted the cost of the program, dramatically improving my productivity and enabling me to be far freer with the number of test renders I created on the way to my finished art. It was transformational in terms of creating animation, reducing animations that previously took days to mere hours, and it's still utterly game-changing. There is one infuriating issue that remains unaddressed, and that's the fact that you cannot do an additive area render using PostFX. In the past, you could do a primary render, make changes to the scene, and render only the changed area on top of the previous render, which meant that the render time was even quicker. I'm acutely aware of the fact that I'm spoiled by having a superb graphics card, which will render most scenes in just a few minutes in most cases. But for people without such a luxury, the ability to avoid a full 20 minute render is still incredibly valuable. The denoiser is accessed via the PostFX panel, which implied additional filters, but disappointingly, Bondren never delivered anything else beyond the feeble exposure and saturation controls that accompanied denoiser at launch. The program also came with a preview lighting issue that far preceded Bondware's ownership and which limits the number of lights considered during scene preview, seemingly turning lights on and off at random and utterly failing to produce usable shadows due to its inability to handle indirect lighting or transparency. Nerd3D kindly explained that this is actually due to a limitation with the OpenGL API and that it is unlikely to be the API used for scene preview in Poser 13. I very much hope not, because it's quite crippling in Poser 12. The program also exhibits some extremely strange behaviours when lighting scenes with ambient lights, failing to show their illumination at all until render time. Also, its gobo lighting does not work in Superfly. One thing that I was very happy to see addressed was the way that the program handled broken materials. The way that materials were wired changed in Poser 11. And up until the very last version 12 patch, certain materials produced extremely strange results. For example, if you applied one of DAZ3D's Elite textures, which utilised the skin node, in the material room, that node showed up with a dotted connecting wire, which meant that it didn't work. That shader may appear black or white in the preview, and would render the same in the final scene. Although this has not been completely resolved, I noticed in the last update that skin textures that formerly required conversion with Snarly Gribbly's Easy Skin tool or Ken 1171's Skin Edit script now work without fixing a good deal of the time. Speaking of Snarly Gribbly, two of his three scripts, Easy Dome and Easy Skin, were among the hundreds of Python scripts rendered useless by Bondware's decision not to support Python 2. Bondware has worked with Snarly as promised, and these invaluable scripts have both been converted to work with Poser 12. Massive thanks to Snarly for his generous donation to the Poser community. Staying with the positives, Bondware added three great quality of life improvements with the final update. The first one is a change to the way that lights are added to the scene. In the past, you clicked on the new light button, a spotlight would be added to the scene near the location of the last edited light, 
You then had to go into the parameter pane to manually position the light where you wanted it, then the properties pane to change it to the type of light you wanted. Now, the light button opens a flyout, enabling you to choose the light type at creation, and the new light appears at the scene center and just slightly forwards in the Z plane, so you can instantly start using it. The latter is so logical in industry standard, it blows my mind that it's taken 12 versions of the program to implement, but well done, Bondware. Bondware has also added a nice straightforward way to create image-based lighting. You could already do that, but this version requires five mouse clicks to set up your own HDRI 360 degree lighting. This is another tremendously useful feature, especially for beginners. The other new last minute feature is a better way to work with layered materials. Although Poser has pretty much always provided a way to combine materials using blend nodes, the addition of new layer tools will both simplify and enhance working with material components. In Poser 10, Smith Micro added layered materials. This enabled you to create an entirely new material layer complete with its own set of properties on top of the base layer and this could be blended according to the user's transparency settings. In the past, you could only save all layers together, but now Bondware has added a new layers palette for quick layer selection, and most importantly, you can save and apply individual layers. This will be great for adding dirt and blood maps, tattoos, makeup, and more. This new material format also comes with its own file type, .mlc or mlz for the compressed format. It would have been nice if the layers palette was dockable, but at the moment it must be closed before you can switch to a different shader or perform any operation beyond choosing a layer. There's also no way that I can see to add a layer shader to all parts of a figure. Future Matt here. Layers can only be saved on a name part basis. Torso, preview, wheel, etc. You cannot save layered shaders at all which means that you cannot reapply layers to any object that doesn't have the same part name, making this significantly less useful than it could be. I suspect that by editing the files in a text editor, you could change the target of the layered material, but you shouldn't have to get that deep under the hood. Throughout the program's life, I alluded to an apparently consumer detrimental relationship between Ken 1171 and Bondware, which appeared to extend far beyond that of vendee and favoured vendor. And that suspicion has only been amplified over the year. Rather than doing it for the user's benefit, the destructive switch to Python 3 seems like a deliberate move by Bondware to enable only authorised, non-pirated scripts to run. This is laudable, but why then did they not also lock the vastly greater content library behind authorization? It appears to be because the move serves two purposes. It enables Bondware to profit from each of these scripts, but it also reduces the requirement on them to offer the functionality that the scripts provide. Looking at the number of scripts for sale on Bondware's store, Ken 1171 scripts virtually monopolize the marketplace with just a half handful by alternate vendors. One such example is his inverse kinematic script, IK Manager, which provides functionality long overdue in the base program. Ken's claims that the switch was designed for the benefit of Python authors who simply could not make a living writing for Poser looks shallow given the way that he is far and away the greatest beneficiary of this detrimental change. He is also one of the most promoted vendors on their store, having been mentioned repeatedly this year. And again I ask, do other content creators not also deserve the same protection in that case? In my opinion, the abandonment of Poser by its owners was one of the major reasons that made it unviable to create for, as well as the refusal by all stores, Renderosity, Daz, CG Bytes, and others now deceased, to collectively fight for the protection of their vendors' products. Renderosity's imperious content creator store policies are another reason for the exodus of vendors, increasing the amount of post-creation work and hoops to be jumped through to list on their subpar store. Moving on, an annoying problem has been manifesting for me for several updates, namely the GPU engine simply refusing to render, whether optics or otherwise. I thought that this was down to a GPU memory leak of some sort, because if I load Poser afresh, sometimes the scene will render, and I can always render a recalcitrant scene using my CPU. However, looking at the log, it reports other issues such as 
CUDA error at CU module load, no binary for GPU. So perhaps there is a more serious driver issue afoot. Another strange bug has shown up on busy scenes since the last version. A right mouse click in the scene window to access the context menu will sometimes crash the program. No warning, just an instant crash to the desktop. Yet another negative change introduced in one of the more recent versions is a modified search functionality that combines search results. For instance, you may search for cat and receive a list of two dozen animals. If you type dog into the search box before the previous search is completed, press enter and nothing appears to happen. It's only when you scroll down past all the cats that you discover that the dog search has been appended to the end of the previous search result list, which is still being populated. Whereas in the past, far more logically and usefully, it used to replace it. If you wait for the first search to fully complete, then the search function works as expected. This new mode is counter to all logic. The back button that enabled you to return to earlier searches has also been removed. One seemingly minor loss to the Python 3 switchover was the depth of field script. This enabled you to select any object or body part in the scene, click on the DOF button and the program would return the item's distance from the camera. This value could then be utilised in the camera settings for depth of field blurring. Bondware replaced this with a 45 degree angled DOF crosshair that shows up in the scene as you adjust the focal distance. On one hand, a visual guide, while less precise, may seem more intuitive, especially for novices, but the massive issue is that it only provides any degree of accuracy when calculating the DOF for items that the crosshairs actually pass over. Any object at the cardinal compass points, north, south, east or west for instance, must simply be judged, and it's very easy to get wrong. A DOF grid that divided the entire screen into one centimetre squares would have alleviated this entirely predictable problem. Alternately, enabling you to move the crosshairs centre in X and Y, whilst needlessly complicated, would have served the same purpose. Sadly, this important function has not been altered over the past year. It was very smart of the previous owner, Smith Micro, to provide superfly rendering of poser surface materials in Poser 11. This provided a pseudo-physically based simulation of legacy materials, which, whilst not perfectly accurate according to real-world physics, nevertheless produced superior results over the old Firefly renderer in most cases. The downside is the values used by the Firefly engine produce wildly differing results with Superfly. One particularly clear example is with all glossy effects, which are far shinier in Superfly with the same values. It would have been a nicety if Bondware had provided an optional single button conversion from Firefly to Superfly versions of the Poser root node materials, and a dream come true if they offered conversion from Firefly to the fully accurate PBR Cycles engine, even just as an approximation that served as a starting point. I'd also love to see Bondware produce a series of copyright-free cycled skin templates as a starting point so that we can all create great skin conversions of our old faves or new ones from scratch. Yes, such skin would still depend upon the quality of the bitmaps used and the quality of their capture or creation, but it would be a massive step forwards and seeing incredible figures coming out of Poser will only help Bondware's interests. Speaking of cycles, the render engine Smith Micro adapted from the superb free 3D modeling and animation program Blender. In Blender, all models show in the preview window fully textured, whereas in Poser they only show up as white. I would have hoped that with a year to address that important issue, Bondware might have come up with a solution. Sadly, the company has not. It would not be an overstatement, in my opinion, to suggest that the program's greatest limitation was, and still remains, for the absolutely vast majority of users, and especially potential users, its inability to support Genesis figures created for DAS Studio. I remain wholly unconvinced by explanations given for why this is the case. I find it impossible to believe that DAS would turn away the opportunity to take on a massive new audience for its content and try as Bondware might to produce alternate figures, they simply fail to generate the interest of the Genesis figures. I'll be honest, I've never liked the Lafemme or Lom family of figures, but a recent scan of the shop showed that the range has greatly increased, but, 
like so many of the figures in the renderosity store, by and large, the new generation content just looks off with much less variety of figure types. DAS has an infinitely superior store, better quality control, cross-figure clothing and hair fitting, grafting and other advantages. Yes, conversion would be technically challenging, but it's absolutely worth the effort. To conclude, Poser 12's greatest feature is easily its blistering fast rendering speed, although Bondware has undoubtedly continued to make modest but truly valuable improvements in other areas. And to my mind, Poser is a much more user-friendly program in almost every area of its operation. Its greatest weakness is still its incompatibility with DAS content, but that's just one weakness of many. The quality of its rendering and lighting are also so much worse. It's possible that this is simply because the program doesn't come with killer figures and light rigs out of the box, but DAS provides so many more options with lighting, such as colour temperature, global location, time of day and all manner of filters. While game engines can produce ray tracing that utterly embarrasses Poser and to a lesser extent DAS Studio, albeit at a lower level of physics realism, Unreal Engine and Unity produces results in real time that most Poser users would drool over, regardless of whether every photon of light would pass Newtonian muster. Poser's rendering speed is still enough to keep me interested, and I really appreciate the other minor improvements, but the program is in desperate need of a major technology infusion.